Welcome to Math 349, Lecture 34. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about how do you find good statistics, good objects to study in mathematics? You know, a lot of times, well, people are interested in X, we're going to study X. But how do people get to that? A lot of times it's inspired by real world problems. And then whenever you have an object, the natural question to ask is, how can I generalize this? What else can I look at? Why did we choose to do this? So one of my favorite examples is the QWERTY keyboard. Why do we have the QWERTY keyboard? To slow people down, right? Uh, does anybody know how to send an email to somebody? Yes. Does anybody know how to copy somebody? Yes. What field do you put the name of somebody you're copying in? And what does CC stand for? Carbon copy. In the 21st century in the electronic age, we talk about carbon copying in email. There's been some discussion that maybe we should no longer say carbon copy. And in some circles, they actually say now courtesy copy because it has at least the same abbreviation as CC. A lot of times things are just institutionalized. It's been studied, it's been done this way. So we keep doing things this way. Always think about, is this really the right object to look at? And sometimes the answer is no. It's just this has been historically studied, historically investigated, historically used. So we're going to keep using this. But for some things, there may be a better choice. So always be aware of what you're doing and why. So I've got some links over here. We're going to see later on some inequalities. And these are just some links to some papers on that, as well as a version of this lecture that I've given to continuing education teachers. All right, so the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about a mean. So we have to figure out what do we mean when we talk about a mean? Or sometimes we use the word average. So let's assume we have two numbers, x and y. Without loss of generality, let's assume 0 less than x, y, less than equal to y. Maybe I want to allow x to be 0 as well. You know, Maybe somebody really bombed the exam in the class. So can somebody give me a good definition of a mean for the x and y? So what would be a good definition for mean? Let's try x plus y over 2. This is the standard definition we've all grown up on. What properties should the mean have? Good, so it should be between x and y. So x should be less than equal to the mean of x, y should be less than equal to y. And this is a corollary. If x equals y, we get the mean of x and x equals x. That follows immediately from the sandwich theorem. If the mean has to be between x and y, and they're the same. All right. This is a really obvious property that the mean should have. If I tell you one value is four, the other value is six, on average, I have eight. Does that seem absurd? There is a situation where that did happen in the real world. Uh, before World War I, when Churchill was in the Admiralty, there was a discussion in the British circles over how many ships, you know, like the dreadnought class, should they be building? And they used to have a requirement that they wanted to be able to handle the next two strongest navies in the world. And after a while, it was no longer quite possible to do that. So we hope that we don't have to fight the next two strongest navies. Parliament thought they needed four more. Churchill thought they needed six. After lengthy conversations, they settled on eight. And this is not a standard mean. This was just as they were discussing the problem, they realized, well, actually, the situation with Germany is even worse than we thought. Six is not going to be enough. We need eight. But you always want to ask, what properties should something have? And if it doesn't satisfy these properties, something strange should be going on. Is there any other property that the mean should have other than it's between x and y? I mean, if it's just x and y should be um, the same distance. So that's now a stronger property. So we could have a wish list. Maybe the distance of the mean to x equals the distance of the mean 
to y. This equi distance between them. You can absolutely insert, you know, assert that as a property that you want the mean to have. As soon as you do that, it will uniquely specify the mean. So this fixes the mean of x and y to be x plus y over 2. Nothing else would work once you put this constraint on. Now, this is, of course, if we're using the standard definition of distance. If we use a different metric of distance, we could potentially have something else. So the question is, what properties does something have to have to be a mean? You know, if it doesn't have this, I'm not going to consider it a mean. So clearly, we need the mean to be sandwiched between x and y. I would say that this is a desirable property, perhaps, but I don't think this is a required property. And if I, if I impose this, I only have one choice of mean. So the question is, could I have different choices, different functions? So can anybody think of any other properties you might want to have? Or is this basically, as long as my function satisfies this, I will consider it a mean. So here is a potential interesting question. What if I have A less than equal to B, less than equal to C, maybe less than equal to D. I've got the mean of A, B, and the mean of C, D. And I take the mean of that. Any thoughts about what that should equal? So right now we haven't defined the mean of four objects. So one possibility is um, extend mean to n objects above is the mean of a, b, c, d. Can you think of something else? So if we don't extend the mean to the mean of four objects, I take A and B, I take the mean, I take C and D, I take the mean, and I take the mean of that. What else could I have done? The mean of BC and, yes, yeah, so, so look at all possibilities, all arrangements. Maybe I wanted to equal the mean of the mean of BC and the mean of AD. You know, this could be a very desirable property for something to have. You know, should it matter how I pair things up? Should there be a nice way to get the mean of four objects in terms of the means of smaller sets? So again, it's trying to think what objects do you want? Now, there are other choices of means. So there is the geometric mean. And here, uh, if zero, okay, zero less equal to x less equal to y, then the geometric mean of xy is defined to be the square root of xy. And the arithmetic mean is what we've been using you know, so far, just x plus y over two. So why do I have x and y greater than or equal to zero? Yeah, I don't want to take a square root of a negative number. So when I'm looking at this, this is why I'm assuming that when I'm taking my means, my quantities are you know, non-negative because I want to be able to take square roots. Does the geometric mean satisfy the requirements of a mean? Does the arithmetic mean satisfy the requirements of a mean? So exercise, show 
both of these uh, satisfy x less than or equal to the mean of x, y less than or equal to y. So you know, go through and do the algebra. Which do you think is going to be the harder algebra, the arithmetic mean or the geometric mean? Geometric mean. So consider um, the square root of x, y. Can you give me something that's going to be less equal to the square root of x, y? Zero. The square root of x squared. So the square root of x times x will clearly be less equal to the square root of x times y. And give me an upper bound. Square root of y squared. So x is less equal to uh, the geometric mean of x, y is less equal to y. And so that would be the proof that the geometric mean satisfies the requirement we want. And similarly, you can calculate the, G, the arithmetic mean and, and show that the arithmetic mean satisfies this inequality. Which is the better mean? Depends, right? Let's say I'm trying to calculate your average in a class. Do you want me to use the arithmetic mean or the geometric mean? What's your intuition? Okay, why? Right, but again, you know, we, we use the QWERTY keyboard. We, it's been institutionalized. You know, so which would you rather have me use to calculate your average, the geometric mean or the arithmetic mean? Why? Yeah, but you've had multiple classes with me by now. You should know not to trust me. But of course, I have to occasionally be trustworthy. Otherwise, we'd always know what to negate. Anybody ever see the Seinfeld episode, The Opposite? Well, no. yeah. well I was answering Okay. I think you want arithmetic. You say you got 100 and a 0. Good, good. So always gather data. So let's do x, y, the arithmetic mean of x and y, and the geometric mean of x and y. So if we're going to do this, we want to choose nice values for x and y. So what would be a good value for x and y? So you said 100 and 0. So the arithmetic mean would be 50.5, and the geometric mean would be 0, right? Oh, I'm sorry, 50, sorry. Um, I was thinking of the next problem. Yes, it's just 50, thank you. So your geometric mean would be zero. So I could do, of course, x equals one and y equals 100. This is what I was thinking of, 50.5. And then the geometric mean is 10. So you have 100 and you have a one and your geometric mean is 10. Give me some other choices of x and y where I can calculate the arithmetic and the geometric mean easily so I can compare them. Okay, well, if they're equal, then the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean have to be the same. So, what I, so if I ever give you x and y are the same, then we know everything has to be the same by the squeeze theorem. Good, give me perfect squares, right? So if I give you, four and nine, thank you for giving me uh, an odd. Oh, yeah. So instead of four and nine, we would either give me two odds or two evens. Come on, be nice to me. 16 and, okay, we can do four and 16. So we do four and 16, the arithmetic mean is 10 and the geometric mean is going to be eight. It's closer, right? What else? Let's do one more. Maybe 925. That adds up to 34, so 17. And three times five is 15. So this is only a small amount of data. Do you have a conjecture? Nope. 
as x and y become closer, then the Not necessarily. So you're not 100% correct in what you said. You said the arithmetic mean is larger, greater than or equal to. I'll accept that as a conjecture. Why do you have to include the equal? Yeah, when x and y are the same, we know that the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean are the same. So if we're going to make a conjecture, we know we can't have the arithmetic mean always greater than the geometric mean. But maybe that's the only time that happens. So again, you could gather more data and try to see what's going on. We could also try to look at large values or small values. So let's look at extreme cases. So look at extreme cases. Let's do you know, zero less than equal to, let's do strictly less than x less than y. Because of course, if x equals zero, it's not going to be that hard to compare the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean. And if x equals y, it's not going to be hard. Now, one of the things I love more than anything else is without loss of generality. So without loss of generality, I can choose either x or y to take on a specific value. What would be a good value to take on? One. So with all of you know, either x equals one or y equals one. And if you look at our formulas, you know, if I give you the arithmetic mean of ax ay, that's just a times the arithmetic mean of x and y. And if I give you the geometric mean of ax ay, whoa. That's just going to be a times the geometric mean of x and y if a is greater than zero. This is a nice property that the mean should have. And actually you might even want to incorporate this as a new property that the mean must satisfy. If I rescale by a constant, the mean should be rescaled by that constant. So maybe we add a property. So new required property, the mean of ax ay is equal to a times the mean of xy if a is greater than zero. That seems like a really good property to have that if I rescale, so instead of measuring things in yards, I measure things in feet, I should just multiply the mean by a factor of three. So we did not initially have this property. So we missed this. But now after our discussion, this seems like a very natural thing to have. And we were led to this by saying, well, look, let's try to make the algebra simple. Either have x equals one or y equals one. And I can rescale because as long as they're not zero, I can always choose a to be either one over x or one over y. So if I take x equals one, I might look at what happens as y goes to infinity. Or if I take y equals one, I might look at what happens as x goes to zero. And I can investigate some extreme cases. Which would people rather look at? Y gets very, very large or x gets very, very small? Okay, so let's let, let y equal one and x goes to zero, then the arithmetic mean of x and y is approximately what? So x is going to zero and y equals one. So what's the arithmetic mean approximately? One half. And then the geometric mean of x and y would be approximately what? A little bit more specific than zero. It's approaching zero, but you can, you can quantify how it's approaching zero. So if, if y equals one and x goes to zero, what's the geometric mean? Square root of x, which is going to zero. So you can see in this case that the arithmetic mean will be greater than the geometric mean. So AM would be greater than or equal to the GM here. And you could similarly do a calculation instead 
of x going to zero, y going to zero. If y went to zero, what would the arithmetic mean look like? I'm sorry, if y goes to infinity, what would the arithmetic mean look like? Well, but tell me how it's approaching infinity. So if y is going to infinity, what does the arithmetic mean look like? Well, it's not infinity yet. You know, for large values of y, as a function of y and x equals one, what would the arithmetic mean look like? Yeah, now let x equal one, y go to infinity, and the arithmetic mean of x and y would look like y over two, and the geometric mean of x and y, what would that look like? Square root of y. And since you know y is going to infinity, y over two is gonna be much larger than the square root of y. What if y equals one? Then the square root of y is actually larger than y over two. Is that a contradiction? There could both be one. We're assuming x is not equal to y though, but y could be extremely close to one. If I take y equals extremely close to one, which is larger, y over two or square root of y? Square root of y. So maybe the arithmetic mean is not always greater than the geometric mean. Is there a mistake? I'm not considering the x plus y. I'm not considering the x plus y. I'm looking at as y goes to infinity. As y goes to infinity, what does the arithmetic mean look like? Y over two. This is like someone going up to Elon Musk and saying, we made a mistake, you know, we forgot this extra, you know, dollar that you have in your savings account. Your assets are a little bit larger than you expected, right? Now, if you happen to tell him, actually the mistake was, you know, we were off by, you know, $200,000. Do you think this is gonna change Elon Musk's life if there's a $200,000 difference in his entire net worth? If there's anybody in class who this does not change, as I said before, please talk to me afterwards, right? But for us, a $200,000 swing would be sizable. And so as y goes to infinity, yes, the arithmetic mean looks like y over two, but for small values of y, this approximation is not valid. This only holds when y is very large. For small values of y, it's x plus y over two or one plus y over two. And then, that one that we drop now becomes very important when y is small. So this is leading us to a belief that the arithmetic mean might always be at least as large as the geometric mean. And so this is you know, the very famous arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality. So AM GM inequality still less than or equal to x less than or equal to y than the Geometric mean of x, y is less than equal to the arithmetic mean of x and y. So there's lots of ways to prove this. One of my favorites uses perhaps the most valuable inequality of all. If u is an r, then u squared is not negative. This is an extremely useful inequality. You know, if you take any number that's real and you square it, it can't be negative. And now we use the method of divine inspiration. Right? What can you tell me about the square root of y minus the square root of x squared? Nope. Non negative, right? It could be zero. So this is greater than or equal to zero. So if we expand things out, we get y minus two square root of xy plus x is greater than or equal to zero, or uh, x plus y over two is greater than or equal to the square root of xy. And then that will you know, clearly be greater than or equal to zero because we've chosen x and y to be non-negative numbers. So this is one way to prove 
the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality. Any questions about this? What's bad about this proof? Yeah, it needs the method of divine inspiration. You need to know to look at the square root of x, uh, the square root of y minus the square root of x, and square that. This is not an unnatural thing to look at. And again, there's a lot of math proofs that use stuff like this, but it is um, a little bit of a difficulty. I'm not even going to try to draw a circle well. So this is a circle. Here's the center. And then This distance here is going to be y, and this distance here is going to be x. I'm going to prove the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality by looking at a circle and reminding you of geometry. How many people remember their geometry? So this is a chord to a circle, right? It, yeah, no, I mean, you can forget it, but it's a chord, okay? This is a chord. What should we call the chord? We need a name. C. Does anybody remember the relationship between C, X, and Y? So you have clearly, you know, because it's your perpendicular. Does anybody remember the relationship between C, X, and Y from geometry? Okay, how might we try to find a relationship? What do we know from geometry? Triangles, what kind of triangles? How can we get right triangles? Okay, so we wanna connect the endpoints of C to where? Um, to X and Y? Yeah. So we can go like that. Any other places where we might wanna connect? To the center, right? When in doubt, just throw everything in, right? These are all the possible auxiliary lines. Now, let's start giving things names. Um, A, O, B, um, D, well, yeah. I don't wanna use C because I've already got C for the quarter. and I don't want people to be confused with my writing. And it's a requirement that you have to use O for the center. Where are my right triangles? I'm sorry? Yep. So what right triangles do we have? Okay, so OBE, um, ABE, DBE, You've given me three right triangles. There is a fourth. Ah, geometry. Um, it, we, we don't. We don't have. We don't have. We don't have A B C. We don't have a C. A E D. So for A E D, you use the fact that the angle A E D is half the angle that it subtends, and that's 180 degrees, so that has to be 90. There's a lot of different ways you can try to prove that this is a right angle. Uh, given the fact that we know this is 90 here, um, we can start playing various games. If this is alpha over here, and this is beta over here, this is 90 over here, then this angle here has to be 90 minus alpha. Right. This whole thing here has to be 90 minus beta. If this angle is gamma here, this is 180 minus gamma. But those have to add up to 180. So you would have beta 
plus 90 minus beta plus, hopefully I haven't made a mistake. Oh, sorry. This over here is 90 minus gamma up here. So this whole thing is 90 minus beta. Just that little part there is 90 minus gamma. And so we want to show that the angle AED adds up to 90 degrees. And this over here, if I want to do just this part, that would be 180 minus beta minus 180 minus gamma. Right. And so you can start trying to play games and see, can you prove that this happens to be a 90 degree angle? You know, can you get enough relations to make it work? Essentially what we're trying to say is that if we have something like this, um, angle AED is one half the angle subtended. Okay. Now that we have all these triangles, let's have some additional names. So we need the length of AE, let's call that A, and the length of ED, let's call that D. And so now we have a bunch of relations. So we have from triangle OBE, we have Y squared plus C squared is A squared, right? And then we have triangle A, B. Oh, was that triangle A, B, E? Oh, sorry. I think. Sorry, I, I put this in the wrong spot. This should be down one. Okay. Sorry. That's from triangle A, B, E we get the two sides y squared and c squared sum to the hypotenuse a squared. For the first one, we have triangle OBE. And so what are we going to get for triangle OBE? What are the two sides? Right, so what's OB? So it's the radius minus X. What's the radius? So it's X plus Y over two minus X, right? Squared plus C squared equals X plus Y over two squared. What about triangle DBE? What would we get? X squared plus C squared equals D squared. And then triangle AED, what would we get? So X plus Y squared is A squared plus D squared. So when you look at this, it seems like, hmm, if I take these two and add them, that equals the third. So that implies x squared plus y squared plus 2c squared is x plus y squared. So x squared plus y squared plus 2c squared equals x squared plus 2xy plus y squared, so c squared equals xy, so c is the square root of xy. And now we use triangle OBE. From triangle OBE, we know the hypotenuse is greater than a side. So 
x plus y over 2 has to be greater than or equal to, or I guess in this case, it would be strictly greater than the square root of xy. Is there any chance when it could actually be equal? Yeah, if x equals y, then they could be equal. Because if x equals y, then the x plus y over 2 minus x is actually just 0. And then the length OB is actually just 0. And it's just going straight up. So this is a geometric proof. If there's time at the end of class today, I'll go through a strange you know, induction proof uh, for generalizing this. But I want to talk a little bit um, first on other generalizations. Okay. Any questions on you know the proof of the arithmetic mean geometric mean? Okay. So let's try to consider other possibilities. So if we have now, let's say zero less than equal to x one let's go to x2, let's go to, let's go to xn. We have the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean. Anybody want to give me a suggestion for the geometric mean? For the geometric mean? All right, what do you want to have that one? Square root of x1, x2. The square root of x1 through xn. And what should the arithmetic mean? That should be the sum. So can anybody think of something that might live between them? So let's look at the far left. The far left is a polynomial of degree n. This is a polynomial of degree 1. And this is symmetric. In the variables, and this is symmetric in the variables. Oh, sorry, that should be the answer. Yes, sorry. Absolutely should be the answer. Can someone give me something that might be sandwiched between these? I'm sorry? Okay, what would be the middle term? So what am I putting in? Oh, okay. Just taking just one term. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there might be some issues if we only take one term. And then that no longer depends on all the data. So I want something that depends on all the data. Ah, so yeah, can we come up with polynomials that are symmetric with small degrees? So let's look for you know, symmetric polynomials of intermediate degrees. Well, the easiest case to look at, we have three things. Here we have x, y, and z. We've got the cube root of x, y, z. And then we have x plus y plus z over 3. What would be the degree of the item in between? I'm sorry? What would be the degree? We have a degree 3 polynomial here. This is degree 1. So we need a degree 2 polynomial. Give me a degree 2 polynomial that's symmetric in x, y, and z. So that's one possible, well, x plus y plus z squared would be degree two, but it's not symmetric in x, y, and z. If I switch the order of x, y, and z, the polynomial changes. So you know, when we write x less than equal to y less than equal to z, that's putting in a nice order. But really, the mean shouldn't matter which order I add things, which order I combine things. The mean of x, y should be the mean of y, x. So x, y plus z squared is not going to be symmetric. 
Okay, so if you do x plus y plus z squared, that's essentially just squaring the arithmetic mean. It's not re I mean, it's degree two, but it's not really degree two. Can you give me something else you could try? I'm not squaring the products, but take So if you take the product, what degree would be the product of two terms? So if I do x times y, what would be the degree of x times y? Nope, two. So is x plus y, is that symmetric in x, y, and z? There's no z term. So I should, I need to add more stuff. What do I need to add so I have something that's symmetric in x, y, and z? x plus y is not enough. Oh, y, z, and then x, z. So if I have something like this, and now let's divide it by a, and let's raise it to the bth power. And maybe it will be sandwiched in between these. And I claim this is a natural thing to study. We're looking at all of the stuff paired in groups. So I'll call this maybe mean uh, two, three of x, y, z. Now I got to figure out what values of a and b should I take. Can anybody give me any choices of the triples x, y, and z where we should know what the answer is? They're all the same. So if we look at the mean of x, 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 that's going to be 3x squared over a to the b. And what should this equal? That should equal x. So therefore, what should a equal? What should b equal? A is three and B is one half. There's nothing else that will work. And so this suggests that we might be able to form a mean of the form X, Y plus Y, Z plus Z, X over A raised to the bth power. And you can check and see that with this definition, you know, if I replace X, Y, Z with alpha X, I guess we we're using A before, with A, X, A, Y, A, Z, Oh, no. Uh, I, no, I do want to use alpha because I've got A above for here. So if I replace it with alpha X, alpha Y, alpha Z, the new mean is just alpha times the old mean. And it turns out that you can always form these new means that are sandwiched between what you already have. So if I give you four objects, um, so say I gave you W, let's go to X, let's go to Y, let's go to Z. We would have uh, W, X, Y, Z to the one fourth over here. We would have W plus X plus Y plus Z over four over here. We have two other things coming in. So the first, the W, X, Y, Z, that's something of degree four. Can you give me something of degree three that I can put in? W, X, Y. Oh, w, How many terms should there be? It's four choose one. There are four quantities. We have to exclude one. So there should be four terms. We should divide this by something and raise this to a power. What should we divide it by? Four. And what power should we raise it to? One third. And there's you know, four choose one, 
choices of what to exclude, or four choose three things to take. So that would be all the ways to take things in threes. We could take things in twos. How many ways will there be to take things in twos? Four choose two, and what would that be? So we could have wx plus wy plus wz plus xy plus xz plus yz. What should we divide that by? Six and take that to the one half power. And we should have a family of inequalities like this. So what I hope you see is that these are very natural ones to look at. That you, we start off with these inequalities for um, you know, the arithmetic mean, the geometric mean, which you've seen before, but there's ways to extend them. And there's a different, there's an ordering. So sometimes one ordering or one inequality is better than another. Who here has been in an elevator? What's the first thing you do when you get into an elevator? Nope. If you're really safety conscious, you check the weight requirement, right? And you look and see who else is coming in the elevator, right? Which is worse to underestimate or overestimate the capacity the elevator can take? Under. Okay, why is it bad to underestimate how much the elevator can take? Okay, so if you underestimate the capacity, if the elevator could take 2,000 pounds and you say it can take 1,800, then what just happens is you don't have as many people maybe get on the elevator as possible or you don't have as much stuff hauled up as possible. What would happen if you overestimated the capacity of the elevator? You said it could take 2,000 pounds, but it can really only take 1,500. What might happen? It falls. So I would actually say it's worse to overestimate what the elevator can do than to underestimate. Right? And so different inequalities, we know that they have an ordering. So there could be some advantages or disadvantages in terms of which way you have errors that you might want to do one thing rather than the other. So I'm not going to go through the proof right now. It's in the handout. You should try to do this. So Lagrange multipliers, do people remember these? So let's say I give you, you know, zero less than or equal to x1, xn, and I want to look at the arithmetic mean over n versus the geometric mean. Without loss of generality, I can assume that x1 times xn equals 1. Why, you know, it's trivial. Trivial if product is zero. Oops. If not zero, rescale to make one. So this is now a Lagrange multiplies problem. I have my constraint function. You know, the product is equal to one. Instead of looking at the product and taking the nth root, what might be easier to look at? Nope. Instead of looking at the nth root of the product, which is one, just look at the product. Like, don't minimize the square, don't ever minimize the distance always minimize the square of the distance. So see if you can do Lagrange multipliers and finish the proof. All right, so this is a good place to stop.